Joining me tonight, uh, our guest speaker is Mr. Kieran Woodhouse, who's travelled all the way from West Midlands to be with us today. Kieran has had a lifelong interest in such things as conspiracy theories and all types of the paranormal, including ghosts, where he spends a lot of time investigating haunted locations. He also has an interest in UFOs, and also something a few of you are interested in. Hi, Brian. Hello. And that's Bigfoot. He believes, like a lot of us, that quite a few of these subjects may in some way be connected. I know he's done a lot of radio shows and podcasts, and I also know he's written a very interesting book entitled An Introduction to Paranormal Investigation. He may have a few copies of it this evening, I don't know. He has, yeah. Uh, he's also a big interest in playing and watching rugby, but I don't think we'll go down that road this evening. Uh, he's also got a young baby to go home to. I think he's just that how old is he? She? Four weeks, so congratulations. So he should make his way home tonight, I don't know, we have to do all that trip on Monday, but there you go. Uh, anyway, tonight Peter will address us on the subject of paranormal investigation, where he demonstrates different types of investigative equipment and enlightening us as to his own personal experiences he's had using them, um, together with what were genuine and perhaps more spurious readings, perhaps. We'll also find out why during an investigation you should keep away from curries and red bull. Oh, I don't know either. I have no idea. I'm sure it will become apparent. So, anyway, please give King a warm Welsh Swansea welcome from Sunbon. Thank you. Um, and people were kind of falling for the same tricks over and over again, but they weren't asking any questions. Questions such as, you know, what is the equipment that we're using? Why do we use it? Um, what, what is a spirit? And, and, and why are we doing these different techniques? Nobody really asks those questions. Um, so, beginnings. So, one question I always get asked is, why? What got you into this? What got you into the paranormal? So when I was a child, about six, seven, eight, I grew up in, um, it was a flat, I lived on the top floor, um, and it was haunted. So um, if there's any sceptics in here, um, that's fine. Hello? <laughs> that was a ghost. <laughs> um, so what we, used to, what we used to find was we, we'd go out on an evening as a family, we'd go out for, for a meal or to see other family members, we'd come home and the living room furniture would have been rearranged. So ornaments within the living room would have been moved. And it was always moved in such a way that my mum's nan would have had it rearranged. So she always used to come in when she was alive and tell my mum that she's got no, um, I guess, like, I don't know, interior design skills and she should be designing her living room differently. And it was always so um, she would make my mum move the ornaments. And Someone doing that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back to get out of the KTV. Yeah. Um, so we'd come back and it would all be rearranged. We had a child gate at the top of the stairs, and if my mum ever forgot to lock it, she would uh, we would hear banging as the as the gate would slam itself five or six times to let my mum know you've left the gate open and your children could fall down the stairs. So there were little things like that that used to happen that used to sit you know, I used to sit there and watch my mum talking or shouting at an invisible presence. And as an eight-year-old, I was only ever used to her shouting at me. So to see her shout at something that's not there, you know, got me interested. It got me thinking, well, what's going on here? We moved house. The house we moved to, we never knew at the time until my dad's dad, so my granddad, came round and um, said to my dad, son, I bet you didn't know this, but I was born in this house. And we never knew that. Um, and then it turned out that my granddad died and his, his sister, so my dad's auntie, died. 
and we have a lot of activity there that relates to their kind of presence as well. Um, my dad's auntie was a, a dinner lady, so she had this very, very unique smell of chip grease mixed with really cheap perfume. And you knew that smell. And sometimes you can wake up in the morning, go downstairs, and you'd smell that smell. Um, some people call it nose memory or muscle memory, and, and, and just because you've got it in your subconscious, you might smell it. But uh, it happens, you know, numerous occasions, and we, we certainly think it's the spirit of Auntie Beryl. So, as, mo as happens with most people, you have interests as a child, as a youngster, you get older, you have to get a job, you get a missus, or you get a, a bloke, um, and then your interests or your spare time begins to shrink because you're too busy keeping a roof over your head. Um, and that happened with me. And my interests in the paranormal and everything else kind of fell by the wayside as I was just trying to make my way in the world. I then had a rugby accident, so I was out of action for about a year, had a really bad knee um, injury, had a reconstruction, and I used to be really slim before that, and it was only really since that I struggled to, to keep my weight off. Um, and after the accident, I had nothing better to do than to sit in a wheelchair, basically, because I couldn't work, and got back in to, to this kind of field. So I sit on YouTube and I discovered a series called Ancient Aliens, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. <laughs> yeah. And then, as you know, you watch one video of Ancient Aliens, the next minute 9-11's an inside job, and then you go for every single conspiracy theory on YouTube, and it just it sparked my, uh, my passion again. Now, what happened at this point, about 2012, um, I just got back into playing rugby and myself and my brother were coming back from training and we had a very up close and personal experience with a UFO. So that's the area that we were, um, it was a triangular UFO and it was around about quarter to ten at night so it was quite, it was April time so it was, it was dark. Um, and we came up this, this road here and then as we were kind of just a bit off the map there, as the M5 runs parallel with us, and you're familiar, uh, if you're familiar with it, you always know the motorway's there because you've got the big lights, you've got the noise of the motorway, you, you know the motorway's there. However, we could see out the corner of our eye, big bright light, huge bright light, and I was aware at the time, that's not the motorway, I don't know what that is, but it's not the motorway. As we carried on up the road, as you can see, trees begin to clear, and as you get to the top, there's lots of few farmhouses and that, and um, this light all of a sudden became a craft and it was triangular, it was about a thousand feet away, a thousand feet up, and I'd say it was about the size of half a football pitch, or a rugby pitch, and it had two bright lights on the back corners, nothing in the middle, nothing on the front, and it was cruising so that if I'd have carried on driving at 30, 40 miles an hour, I would have left that thing well behind. Um, so what we did was we pulled over into a lay-by, which you can't quite see, but it's kind of in the trees on the left, Pulled over into a lane where I watched this thing just cruising past us. Um, I turned my engine off, just had the hazards on. It's quite a busy road, this. There were some pubs dotted throughout the country lane. And it's quite a busy road, but there were no cars, nothing, no traffic, nothing was coming past us at the time. And um, the engine was off, and we couldn't hear a thing. Um, you know, you can hear a plane at 20,000 feet, or you hear a helicopter, things like that. We could not hear a thing. It was the sheer silence of it that petrified us. And I'm not ashamed to say, um, you know, we're both big lab, lads, we're both props, and we just sat there crying, because I, I, I can't explain why, but we just sat there crying our eyes out like babies. Um, after about five minutes, it kind of slowly got behind the trees again, and we started to go um, back down into the hill into our hometown. So, just another perspective there. So, it's kind of as we got past the trees on the right there, it, it opens up, it becomes quite clear. You can see for miles over to, you know, to the other side of Birmingham. Um, it's quite a nice view, and it's quite nice to go UFO watching them, um, in that particular area. So, the lay-by there on the left, where we pulled in, and that's what it looked like. Obviously not at that angle, a lot of people say, well, was it like that in the sky? No, that's just to show you. It was obviously flat. Um, Depth-wise, it was difficult to gauge, but I'd say it was probably about 10, 10 to 12 feet in depth. The, and there was no um, compartments, there was no, uh, you know, on a car you can see panels that are put up the build, make up the car. It's just like one solid piece of metal that, that the whole craft was made from. Um, to this day, I've never said it was aliens, because I don't know. Um, but it was, uh, you know, by very definition a UFO, it was an unidentified flying object. 
Uh, I don't know of anything in the government programmes. I don't know if some of you are familiar of anything that's like that. Um, but I got home, obviously researched triangular UFOs and found nothing in that area for that night. All I did find was about 10 years previously, there was what, because it was a triangular craft, they nicknamed it the Dudley Dorito. Um, because there was a triangular craft scene over the course of about a week by hundreds and hundreds of people within the Black Country area. Um, and, and so it was quite similar, I guess. So that, again, kind of re, you know, sparked my passion for, for this kind of field. Um, and then from there, I started to look into um, the nature of reality. Uh, you know, were these things interplanetary, interdimensional? What were they? Um, and that got me into a guy called David Icke, who I assume you all heard of. Sometimes I get a uh, grow oh, David Icke. Um, he, um, I, you know, some things he says I get, some things I'm not so sure on. Um, but he's certainly got more things right than he's got wrong, I think. And he started to make me question the nature of reality and how we perceive the world that we live in. And um, so I started to look into um, the, the makeup of the world and the construct of our, our biology and how, how and why we perceive things as we do. So uh, when I was about, I don't know, so that was 2012, the UFO sighting. So around about, I'd say, 2016, my wife took me on a ghost hunt. I'd never been on one. I'd watched Most Haunted and things like that. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, but she took me on a ghost hunt to Dudley Castle. It was, it was nice. Um, and it, it made me think, I like this. I want to do more of it. So I went with different teams um, and kind of got, got the, I guess, the addiction for it. Because that's what it is. You always want to try and find the next piece of evidence. Um, so, I kind of thought, well, if I'm looking for ghosts, am I interested in aliens, and are they linked, is it possible? Well, kind of, I think it is. Um, tonight we'll mostly be focusing on, on spirits and ghosts, but if you've got any questions on UFOs, just, just shout out. Um, so, we have this table here that, that piqued my interest. So, this shows the light spectrum, and you can see the little rainbow bit that's called visible light there in the middle. And that's what we as humans can perceive. So that makes up about 0.05% of the light spectrum. That's all we can see. So that's 99.95% of the light spectrum that's right around us right now that we can't see and we can't interact with. And that made me think, well, what's happening in this 99.95%? That's a lot of room for things to be happening that we can't interact with. And it clicked. I thought, well, Maybe that's where they are, that's where spirits are, that's where um, Bigfoot is, that's where aliens live. So there's just an example there of what our eyes and ears can pick up. So what I tend to, what I kind of, what I try to do is put it, because I'm not a scientific man um, by nature, and I try to, to make sense of, of, of what I was trying to understand. So I describe it as a radio station and radio frequencies because that's all that's happening around us is frequencies. I'm just a bunch of energy vibrating to a particular frequency in order to exist, as we all are. So what, what got me thinking was if, if you're listening to radio, let's say Radio 1, 1 you've got a bad music taste, but just for this example, if you're listening to Radio 1, that doesn't mean that Radio 2 doesn't exist, it's still there, it's just your radio station is tuned in to that particular frequency. Radio 2 is around, radio two is around you're just not picking it up. If you tune into Radio 2, Radio 1 is still there, you're just not picking it up anymore. You're just not tuning into it. And I'm sure you've all had at one point in the car where two radio stations have mixed up, and you get this combination of two songs, like, and then it goes back to normal. I think that that's what's happening when you see a spirit, or a Bigfoot, or a UFO. So what's happening is your frequencies are getting mixed up in your brain before it corrects itself. I've spoken to so many people, um, people on my podcast, people that I've spoken to just in general, who, who claim that they saw a Bigfoot, he walked behind the tree when he didn't come out the other side, or a spirit was stood in front of them, it just disappeared before their eyes. Same with UFOs, people see a UFO, it just fades into nothing. It doesn't move, it just disappears. So what I think is happening is it's still there. You know, Bigfoot did come out the other side of the tree. It's just that you're not tuning into that frequency anymore. And I propose that mediums, I'm not one myself, 
I have some opinions on mediums. I've got some very close friends who are mediums, they're very good. Um, maybe they have the ability to tune into radio one and radio two at the same time. Therefore, they can pick up multiple frequencies. So to give it another analogy, imagine a block of flats. So if we were in a block of flats and we're living on one particular floor in our frequency, which is visible light, and just knock it to that next slide. And we're living in that particular floor, and above us we might have spirits, below us we might have the greys, top floor Bigfoot's knocking around somewhere, and you're all living within the same block of flats, just on different floors. And what's happening is you can hear them, because they move the furniture around, they play really loud music, they get your TV on a bit too loud, so you know they're there. And you might occasionally cross their path if you get within the elevator to go out for the day, you might catch a glimpse of them down the corridor, but ultimately you can't interact with them because you're on different floors. And I think that's what happens in our world, is that we're seeing beings that are there, or we're not seeing beings that are there, because we can't tune into that particular frequency. Why can't we? Well, there's multiple answers to that. The things we eat, the things we drink, the very fact that we're told that we can't see it, because it's not real. So how many people have come across a child, whether it be their own or a friend's child, who says they have an imaginary friend? Happens quite a lot. And how many people I know of that child being told, it's not real? You can't talk to him, he's not real, he's not there. Grow up. You know, it happened to me last week. <laughs> they tell you, he's not there, just forget about it. So then that child is going to dismiss it. So as he grows up, he sees it, he sees it again, he goes, no, you're not real, I can't talk to you, you shouldn't be here. You're in my, you're in my imagination. And as, as we grow older and older, we learn to dismiss these things so much so that it blocks it out in our mind and we tune out that frequency. We block that frequency. Um, so that's, by the way, if anyone has any questions, please just put your hand up and shout out. Um, it doesn't bother me. So, same with animals. So animals, they, um, some animals, cats, dogs, reptiles, can see into the infrared um, light. So how many people have a pet that sits down in the corner of a room and you think, what are you looking at? Or they growl at something that's not there. You think you'd be, you know, you're stupid, there's nothing there. There is something there, we just can't see it. These can see it. Of course, that's through evolution. So reptiles, they see it because they hunt at night. They need that particular um, eyesight to be able to hunt. But it also enables them to see outside of what we would call visible light. So they see things that aren't really there. Is that what children are seeing? Maybe. So... We'll move on to TV shows, which I've just touched on. So, how many people have watched at least one of those? Good figures. Uh, how many people have been on a ghost hunt? You know, it always surprises me how very few people have actually been. Um, okay, so what do people think of this? What, what, what are your overall opinions? Just shout out. Jump scares. Jump scares. <laughs> yeah. Scooby-Doo talks looks the, the real monsters. Monsters are real people. Um, contrived. Contrived. Okay. Entertainment. Um, my favourite is my ghost story. But I does anyone watch that one? No. It's on some obscure channel on Sky. Um, the reason I like that is because it's real people who show real footage, and it's not a team that go around to locations. They basically just have five different stories on each week and you get to listen to EDPs and see footage that they capture. It's quite interesting. Um, the others, as far as I'm concerned, are nothing more than entertainment programmes. Yeah. It tells you at the start of them, this programme is, is designed for entertainment purposes. If ever you see a programme that says that, it should instantly click, well this is probably not true. So why is it not true? Why is it fake? I'm not saying that all of it is fake. I genuinely believe that these guys all set out with the best of intentions, to capture students. I believe that. But what happens along the way is they get mixed up with TV producers, they get mixed up with um, channels that get a hold of them, and they say to them, you know, look, we need to entertain the audience. And if we're not entertaining the audience, you ain't got a job. So these people, they have to begin to fake things or exaggerate things or make things seem as they're not in order to keep the, the audience entertained. Because if you're not entertained, you won't tune in next week. You think, well, this is boring, nothing's happened. And they lose their jobs. So, 
for the very, was it two or three that have been on an investigation? So for the other people, what you see on Most Haunted or Ghost Adventure or whatever, that's not a ghost hunt. That's not what happens on a ghost hunt. A ghost hunt is sitting there at one o'clock in the morning trying your damnedest not to fall asleep. Or not to fart, which is still much rumbling. Um, which brings me on to Curry and Red Bull. I'll talk about that later. Um, so it's quite a boring affair, to be honest, is, is ghost hunting. And you might do three or four events back to back over the course of a month, six hours, seven hours at a time. And if you capture one single audio um, file, or one little bit of video footage, count yourself lucky. And even then, it might just be a fly, or a bit of dust, or someone coughing in the background that you didn't know. And that's how it goes. But if you watch these programmes, you'd be misled into thinking that it's constant activity. And we get that, we get people come on our investigations, and after 10 minutes, because nowadays the gener this generation, you know, they have to be on Facebook every five minutes, they don't have an attention span. And after five, ten minutes, if nothing's happening, you can see them getting agitated. They're sat there, they're twitching, their phones even come out despite us telling them to turn them off. And we've even had people leave after half hour because nothing's happened. And I just think that's ridiculous. But it's because they watch these programmes. And what you need to understand is on these programmes, they will go to locations and do what we do. Seven, six, seven hours. Out of that six, seven hours, they have to bring it down into a 45 minute TV programme. But in the 45 minute TV programme, there's only about 20 or 25 minutes of actual investigating because at the start they tell you a bit about the location, at the end they show you the evidence that they've captured, they always find evidence, and in the middle you have this 20, 25 minute bit of actually investigating. So out of six or seven hours, they condense it down into that. And if they don't have enough, then they trick things. There's clear evidence on YouTube and other streaming sites of people from Most Haunted. People from Ghost Hunters, um, faking things, you, anybody can go online and find these videos. And the problem is, the second that they begin to rely on having to entertain people, and they become too reliant on money and a job, basically, then their whole reliability as an investigator, in my opinion, goes completely out of the window. And you just can't trust what they say. So, is it real or is it <coughs> fake? I get the feeling some of you think it's fake. Some of it is, I think, is real. Um, but what that's done is it's gone down and it's come, it's filtered down as it always does in every, in every walk of life to the amateur groups. And I call them amateur groups, but they're not so amateur. I'm not sure what it's like in Wales in terms of teams that investigate around here, but um, particularly in England, there's two or three groups that dominate the market. Absolutely dominated. And they're nationwide, they're basically franchises, and they will do 16, 17, 18 investigations a week all around the country, including Wales and Scotland. And um, they would charge through the nose for people to go on investigations with them. Uh, we did a location, and we charged people £30 because it covered all costs. And they did, uh, one of these groups did exactly the same location, £79.99. And we can't fathom why they're charging so much, but people pay it and they go. Now, if you use the same um, thought process for the TV programmes for these groups, if they're charging you a lot of money to come with them, they need to make sure you have a good time. Because if they're charging more than double what other groups are charging, you need to be entertained. Otherwise, these days, you know, word of mouth, a bad uh, <coughs> review on TripAdvisor or Facebook, and they could lose business, and they could lose custom, and therefore they're not in the job anymore. So, again, they become too reliant on making you entertained and then that leads them down the road of trickery and fakery, in my opinion. I've been on some of these. I've seen um, people, um, in-house mediums that they take with them, who are basically there just to guide you and tell you what to see, tell you what to feel. They make sure you feel something. They make sure you go home as entertained as possible to make sure you feel, oh, that £79 was well worth spent and I'll spend it again next month a different location. So, has anyone got any questions or opinions on that? Easy crowd. So, sorry, what would you say the range of fakery and stuff, and what would you expect someone might be doing to jazz things up then? Um, well, the, basically the rest of the presentation is going to be a mix of stories and pieces of equipment that we use, and I'll talk about how those pieces of equipment can be used to fake and to trick 
um, and some examples that I've seen. So I guess I'll answer that as I, as I go through. If, if I haven't answered, just shout again. Um, so for the first piece of equipment that we tend to use as investigators is this. Is everyone familiar with that? Yeah, so it's an EMF meter or a K2 meter. Um, and it's basically designed to pick up any fluctuation in the surrounding electromagnetic field. And it's the EMF meter. Um, this was originally a tool for measuring leaky electrics, faulty wiring, leaky microwaves, <coughs> things like that. Um, but someone stuck ghost hunter or ghost equipment on the back and they charge three or four times the price now. Uh, and they do. I saw one online the other day for £60. Um, you know, I've got electrician mates who brought them back in the day for like a tenner. And that's, that's all they do. Sorry? Uh, yeah, so we always, always tell our, our guests or our team, phone on flight mode, um, you know, because even we as humans give off electromagnetic fields, so anything like that can affect it. Um, so what we tend to do, uh, if we go to a location, is we do a sweep before we start, and we make sure, you know, if there's a particular area where it's, it's getting busy and it's lighting up a lot, we then look for reasons as to why it's lighting up, so is there a faulty fuse box, faulty wiring and things like that. So yeah, a lot can affect it. Ah, cool. <laughs> So you can see if I kind of hold it up to something that's electrical, sometimes it will go off, or not. Can you see that flashing? Yeah. yeah, so it's just picking up on the electromagnetic field surrounding the uh, projector. Now there's a trick with this, Let's see if it works. Um, I've seen this done on, on, on investigations that cost me a lot of money to go on. There's a sweet spot, and if you hold it between on and off, you can make it do that. See? Of course, if it's pitch black, people can't see your thumb slowly moving up and down on it. And I've seen people sit there going, oh, look at that. It's answering on command. Go, go to red. Oh, see that? And, and I've seen that happen. And people fall for it, hook, line, and sinker every time. You know, I'm going to be amazed if you bring out every piece of equipment I talk about. And <laughs> Great. Um, so. The EMF, do I like it, do I not like it? I don't really see why it's in an investigator's an investigative <laughs> toolbox, to be honest. Um, I asked, I've asked people, why do you use an EMF meter? Oh, because it's a field that uses it. Or because the bloke I've ghost hunters uses it. So again, this is the reason I started to do this, and I wrote a book, because I want to try and educate people on what ghost hunting is about, and why we use particular pieces of equipment, why we should, why we shouldn't. Um, this does have sound, I don't think we're hooked up, hooked up to audio though, um, but this is, if you what, to that. So this is at the ancient Ram in, in Gloucester. If you hold the microphone by the sound, it'll come out. That's fairly low, that one. Oh, I don't know where my sound is. If you find my voice a little bit, can we keep it closer to me? There's another green light on the barrel. Can you make that one flash as well? Basically, as a team, they're asking for the light to flash. So what they're doing here is we were sat in a room at the Ancient Ramen, and it's a very famous place, it's been on all TV programmes, and we were sat in a semicircle around the fireplace, and it's a really old building, and this particular room had no electrics, it had nothing that could interfere with this, everyone's phone was on flight mode, and we had that bit of activity. We had one that was on a chair in the middle of the circle, and one of the chairs that formed the circle had one on as well. And what happened was it started to light up independently, as if something was running from one to the other. And the people involved described it as, as it was almost like a child playing. So they moved the one into the circle, and put it next to the other one, and you can see them lighting up. You can take it up to red see if you can hold on there. So he's just asking you to take it up to red and see if you can hold it there. Again, for me. Somebody else to ask. It doesn't really happen. Now, what's interesting to know is when it did kick off, they were both kicking off together. Now, that would make me think that it was something interfering a bit. If, if whatever was doing this could make one go and the other not, I'd be more interested. But the fact that they're both going at the same time to the same strength tells me that. Something is affecting it, but it might not be spiritual. And look, 
Now, if someone took a photo there, you saw it flash, yeah. and instantly after the flash, it's going yeah. mad. It's that's the phone yeah. interference. And again, people, I know people that won't tell you that, they're playing with that sphere of activity. Now what EMF does, electromagnetic field, is it affects the melatonin levels um, that's in our bloodstream. So is anyone familiar with what melatonin is? Yeah? So it's released from your pineal gland into your bloodstream and it makes you tired. So when there's daylight, when there's sunlight, it um, suppresses your pineal gland and therefore it doesn't release melatonin into your blood so you're awake. And then on a night when it gets darker, you get more tired because melatonin is getting released into your bloodstream. These guys, and there's been other studies, dozens of studies that have been done, you can find them all online, have found effects from EMF and melatonin. So when you're asleep in bed, or not, and you've got your Wi-Fi on downstairs, your phone's charging next to you, your Wi-Fi next to you on an iPad, and you've got all this stuff battering you in terms of um, frequencies. It will affect your melatonin levels and it will make you not be able to sleep. Now there's a famous story of a guy in America who just moved into a new house. He spent a lot of money getting it done, but he, you know, he, he was budgeting, so some things he had to leave. And for the first two weeks of living there, he, he was very, very close to getting um, a, a vicar in to exercise the house. He couldn't sleep, he felt paranoid, he had really bad headaches. Every time he'd lie in bed, he felt that someone stood in the corner of the room watching him. He would see shadows walking past out the corner of his eye, walking past his bedroom door. And he felt just all, all round pretty rubbish. After about two weeks, he finally got around to fixing the wiring in the new house. And an electrician came in to fix the wiring and he said, I'll tell you what, you know, the EMF in this house is off the scale. It's a, it's a good job you're getting this fixed. Anyway, they fixed the wire in, probably cost him a lot of money, and voila, his house was exercised. And he could sleep, he saw no more shadows, he had no more paranoia or headaches, and <coughs> it was put down to the fact that he had so much uh, EMF being pumped around his home that he was having a really, really negative effect on him. So again, it's what, you, what, you, what we need to do as people, as investigators, as people that pay to go on investigations, we need to be aware of how all of this can affect us, when people say, I've got a headache, or... I feel paranoid, or I feel like this, I feel like that. There could all, there's always, 99.9% of the time, a reasonable explanation as to what it could possibly be. So it's just a brief description there of what melatonin is. So it's released from the pineal gland, and of course, the conspiracy theorists in me will talk about how things such as fluoride in your drinking water can calcify your pineal gland and can have an effect on you that way as well. Um, but we're not here for conspiracy theorists. Unless you want me to do. Okay, any questions on the EMF meter, the K2 meter? Cell towers, even from five miles away, can give a signal like that because it pulses. So they absolutely. Yeah. Well, we talk about 5G now as well. Yeah, exactly. um, so all of this stuff that's happening is, is having a negative effect on us, whether it be on purpose or not, it's a different story. But it is having an effect on us. So. I always, I've got all the night pyramids in, my bed, in each bedroom that, that helps to soak up um, free, you know, these kind of frequencies. Uh, turn my Wi-Fi off, my phone charges in a different room, and I always try to do things like that so I can get, get a better sleep. You know, people that sit on their phone right up until they try to go to sleep, and then moan, I can't sleep. Well, you know, you're not doing... It's the blue light. It's the blue light, yeah. You're not doing yourself any favours. Is there another question over here for now? Oh. What's in it? Sorry? How does it work? What's in it? What's in this? Yeah. Um, it's ba well, if you open it up, it's basically just a circuit board. Um, I can't answer that, to be honest. Like I say, it, it, it just picks up on... It can only tune in... It can only tune... Yeah, it tells you on, the, um, on there what it goes up to. Uh, yeah. And you can get ones that are more powerful, and you can get ones that aren't as powerful. Um, but it's a very old piece of equipment, really. And it was used for electricians, as I say. Um, there is something different which I'll talk about later called a radio electromagnetism pod, which is called a REM pod, which is a mouthful. Um, and that works slightly differently, and I prefer that piece of equipment. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so another um, experiment that we tend to do is called the human pendulum. Has anyone ever heard of this? Yeah? yeah? Okay. So this works exactly how a pendulum might work. You hold the pendulum and you ask for yes or no answers and moves. Only we use the human body as opposed to using the crystal. 
So as you can see what's happening here is this particular individual is sort of within a circle of people. Um, no reason for the circle, and then so people can see what's going on. We put a person in front and a person behind for their health and safety, and we relax them. Now we don't hypnotise them, you know, none of us are former McKenna, but we just relax them and we, you know, head down on the chest, feet shoulder width apart, just relax. We count down from ten until we think they're suitably relaxed. We've had people fall asleep. <coughs> Amazingly standing up. Um, and once they're relaxed, we begin to ask questions. So we ask for a spirit to give us a yes answer, and they might move. So they might move forwards. We ask for a no answer. Now they always move the other way. So they'll move backwards. Some people move sideways, which is quite interesting, very rare. Um, but they'll move sideways for an answer. And once we've got a yes or a no answer, we then begin to ask our questions. Are you male? Are you female? Etc. Etc. And that's what that's how we use a human pendulum. Now, I have a lot of issues with the human pendulum. One of them being the human, the, the, the subconscious, the mind. Whether you know, whether you want to or not, whether you are trying your hardest to not move, you very well could be. You could be answering the questions yourself. And you know, in my mind, it's more than possible that that's what's going on. The only niggling doubt in my mind is I've had a very, very, um, I guess, emotional experience of doing one of these myself. So we were in a place called Draco Tunnels, which is, uh, anyone heard, heard of Draco Tunnels yet? So it's about five mile worth of tunnels, it was built as a Cold War nuclear bunker, it's near Kidderminster, and it's fantastic. Even if you don't find any ghosts, it's just a great place to go for the, um, I guess for the architecture, but you know, some of these tunnels, <coughs> You can get two Arctic lorries side by side down. Brilliant place to visit. And we were in a little room that used to be used as a doctor's, uh, doctor surgery. And we, they relaxed me. At this point, I wasn't part of a team or anything. I, I was just a pain guest. They relaxed me and they started to ask me questions. I could hear the questions, kind of, like, like they were far away. But I wasn't really paying any attention to the questions. And at one point, according to someone that was there, I was doing the Michael Jackson lead. Now I'm 19 stone and it's almost impossible, I find it difficult just to stand up, um, let alone do this Michael Jackson lead without falling over. Um, and apparently I was rocking backwards and forwards with huge momentum until eventually I felt a smack on the top of my head and it flung me backwards. Some guy had to stop me from falling on the floor, that's why we have people in front and behind and they half carried me out of the room. I felt like a huge grip was on the top of my head, it, like this thing wasn't letting go. They took me next door, the rest of the team stayed, and this one guy tried to calm me down, he offered me a chocolate biscuit, he said that would help, um, and made me keep looking him, him in the eyes. What's your name? I couldn't remember my name. What day is it? I told him it was Wednesday, it was Friday. But eventually, I came round and I was more myself. At this point, we heard a growl, a very animalistic, I guess you'd call it evil growl, that came from behind me. I've turned around to look at what it is, he said, don't focus, just look at me. Eventually, once I was calm enough, we, we, we returned to the room where the rest of the team were. The team had been carrying out an EVP session, so they'd been recording on a digital recorder. And they picked up someone saying, hello. And we worked out the timings, and it was roughly the same time that we'd heard the growl. And again, it made me think, well, is it possible that what we thought was an evil, animalistic, horrible growl, was only what we were hearing on our frequency range. Whereas the EVP recorder that was recording on a different frequency range was actually picking up this spirit saying, hello. And it was, no, it was fine, this, this voice, it was just, hello. And we were thinking, oh, this is horrible. And it's just that our ears, maybe, were picking it up differently to how the EVP recorder was picking it up. So again, if we hear something and we think, oh, that's evil, it might not be, it's just our perception of it. So that's the human pendulum. Um, like I said, I've had a very bad experience with it. I've not done one since. Um, it could easily have been my own subconscious that was, an that was answering the questions, but I can't explain the smack on the top of my head, and I can't explain the growl that we heard and how that coincided with the hello that we recorded shortly after. Something that's similar to a human pendulum, and is more of interest to me, is a spirit walkthrough. Has anyone heard of this? No? So it's basically just an extension of the, of the pendulum. So what we tend to do, you can't really see the pictures very well, but again we form a circle and we can get anyone from two to six to seven or eight people, depends how big the room is, and we line them up in a row 
um, facing each other, facing opposite ways, it doesn't really matter. And of course we've got people in between just to make sure they don't fall over. We then ask for the spirit to communicate with us again, so we ask for a yes answer. Now what's interesting here is they never ever all answer the same way. Ever. So you might get one person go forwards, three people go backwards, one person go sideways and the other one's not moving at all. And when we ask for the other answer, they'll all answer again. And when we then begin to ask questions, yeah, are we dealing with you know, a male? Some people will answer yes, some people will answer no. Or some people will answer yes, which is a different form of a yes. And it's all very confusing, and I think it's all because of the subconscious mind. Now I've had people say to me, no, 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 maybe you're just dealing with multiple spirits and therefore they're all answering. It. And I think, no, yeah, but that's just an excuse, isn't it? That's just you looking for something to explain why it's the, it's the subconscious, it's the human mind. So again, I don't think there's much in this in terms of spiritual activity, I think it's the subconscious. At this point, you're probably all sat there thinking, do you actually believe in ghosts? Because, you, you know, you're slacking it up quite a lot. Um, I always say that I go into a, an investigation to prove that ghosts don't exist. Because if you go into an investigation to prove that they do, you will. Because every noise you hear will be a ghost. Every time you feel, think you've seen something, it's a ghost. How easy is it to say that? It's the same as religious people, nothing against them, but if they can't explain something, oh well it's God, it works in mysterious ways. It's, it's much easier to do that, it's harder to try and explain what it actually is. And that's what I try to do. So is there any questions on spirit walkthroughs or pendulums or anything? Normally during the break I ask anyone to come and have a go at that experiment. Uh, if anyone's willing, I can get a few people up and carry that up. Yeah, I've got a question about the pendulum thing. Yeah, sure. Struck, it reminded me what, from your description of it is the uh, uh, what they do in the, like an evangelist church. Yeah. Where they, yeah. They go into some kind of trance. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And they, they fall, and the vicar goes. Yeah. And he falls over. Yeah. They, they actually put his head on the forehead and they fall over, don't they? Yeah. I've seen. Well, I've seen it where they don't actually touch them. They're like here and they yeah. do that and they all fall off their chair. It's power of suggestion. I, I would put that down to, which is the same as as a pendulum. You know, you're you're saying to this person. Um, give me a yes or no answer basically and they might not think they are but ultimately they're moving and it comes down to the ideometer effect which I'll come into in a minute. So, do you think pre-electronic periods like Madame Blavatsky were as filled with, with, with fake material? I think, um, I think nowadays to kind of look at the other end of that question I often ask are we ever ever going to believe anything that we see again? Because in, particularly in terms of UFOs and ghosts, every time someone sees a picture, we live in an age of CGI and Photoshop. And we, we often think, well, you know, as much as you look at it, you think, oh, I believe that. There will always be someone saying, no, it's CGI, but it's Photoshop. So th there are points now where we could look at things that could be the very best piece of evidence we've ever found. But we just might not be able to believe it or bring ourselves to believe it because we think, well, there's always that possibility that it's faked. If you go back, as you say, to like maybe the 1800s when photography was just coming along. There's various pictures that you can find of ectoplasm supposedly leaving people's bodies and things like that. Is it real? I don't, why don't we get photos of ectoplasm leaving people's bodies now? I think it was basically people that just discovered photography, they were playing with it, they were, they were having a, a good time and what can we do with this piece of technology. They found they could you know, superimpose images over other images and they put them across as, as spirits and ghosts. Around about the same time that they started to make a lot of money off spirits, such as mediums and psychic readings and Ouija boards and things like that, which I'll come on to, to later. Anyone else? Okay. So the next thing that we do, looking at the time, well, we've got about 10 minutes or so. Cool. So this is psychic handwriting or automatic handwriting. Anyone familiar with this? Yeah, it's quite a uh, popular thing. Numerous famous musicians and bands have done this and say they've written a whole album while doing automatic handwriting. I think that's their way of admitting it's a crap album. Um, so you see me there, I'm just sat there in my Warrington Walls and Billy Goody. Um, and what we do is we blindfold each other and we put the pen in our weak hand. So it doesn't really work for ambidextrous people. But we put pen in the weak hand, we relax just like a pendulum and we allow a supposed spirit to interact with us and to write for us, or to draw messages for us and there's supposedly messages from the other side. The most famous, or one of the most famous um, 
pieces of psychic handwriting was carried out by a guy called James P. Taylor, who supposedly channeled Charles Dickens after he died, shortly after he died, and carried on writing one of his books that he never finished. Um, he didn't sell well, so I guess Dickens is a better writer when he was alive than when he was dead. Um, but he claimed that Charles would come to him every night, he scribbled away three or four pages a night, and eventually compiled the rest of the book and sold it. Um, I've done this, and again, not really convinced. I think it's the ideometer effect, I think it's the subconscious, and to prove that, I carried out an experiment. So, we'd spent all day, uh, myself and my friend, we went to ancient Ramin, where I spoke about before, and we went early, we had some dinner in Gloucester, we walked around the field, and we had a nice day. For the whole day, I was constantly planting the name Emma into this guy's head, constantly. Not so much that he knew what I was doing, but you know, we'd have a conversation about school, and I'd say, do you remember Emma from school? Or I'd say, wasn't there a famous woman, Emma, who used to live there? And throughout the day, I just kept mentioning the word Emma. On the night, we carried out this experiment. He blindfolded himself, he sat with a pen in his left hand, and I just watched him. <laughs> and throughout the five minutes of the experiment, his hand was moving slightly, and after the experiment had concluded, I'd gone over, I said, have you written anything? He went, I have, I have. That's what have you got? He said, it's a name. I said, what's the name? Can anyone tell me what the name is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was Emma. And um, I didn't have the heart to let him think it was a ghost. I had to tell him what I'd done. Um, I think he'd probably Brown creep up. Sorry? Brown yeah, but that's what we have to do. Because, you know, it's, it's, that's how we prove. So, so I'm doing an investigation this coming Friday. And I've, I plan to blindfold everyone who's participating in the spirit board and the Ouija board. So they can't see where they're taking the glass to. But it's doing things like this, that, you know, we can begin to narrow down what it actually is that's doing it. So, psychic handwriting, is it real, is it not? I don't think it is. I think it's mainly the subconscious um, and the ideom ideometer effect, or the ideometer phenomenon, which is this. An unconscious or involuntary bodily movement made in response to a force or an idea rather than to a sensory stimulus. So just like the human pendulum, just like the automatic handwriting, I planted the name in his head and it didn't feel like he was, but he probably at some point subconsciously thought I should be writing a name or something here, and he wrote Emma, so I planted it into his head all day. So that's the ideometer phenomenon, and it happens more often than, than not where um, paranormal investigating is concerned. Okay, so we'll carry on with our pieces of equipment that we use. So the next one is very contentious. Very mixed, people love it, people hate it. This is the spirit board. Um, I've done talks where I've pulled out my spirit board and I've watched everyone on the front row just recoil in fear. Um, and it's mainly down to things such as Hollywood and the media and things like that that have really demonised this piece of equipment. Um, because ultimately it's just a tool for communication. Same as a K2 meter or a spirit box or the human pendulum where we're using the human body. It's just a way for a spirit to communicate with us. We've cut pieces of paper out of uh, <coughs> letters out of pieces of paper, put them in a circle on the table, used a glass, and it still worked. So it's got nothing to do with the board. The board is just a piece of wood with letters on it. It's not a portal for hell or anything like that. So I'm not sure how many people of you actually know. But um, the, the term Ouija board is actually trademarked by Hasbro, which is the gaming company who make, I don't know if they make Monopoly or whatever, but games like that. And um, it's trademarked by them because ultimately that's all it was, it was a game. So people in the 1800s would sit around, they would eat their boiled goose or whatever they used to have, and then they would retire to the parlour and they would play with their Ouija boards. And Ouija is obviously we oui and ya, yes, yes, in French and German because that's what they were trying to do, get yes answers from spirits. Um, so just a few facts here. So um, used predominantly as a pilot type game, as I say. Opposed by the Catholic Church <coughs> as well as other religious sectors because they believed it had a negative effect on people such as demonic possession. Uh, it also became popularised after the Civil War due to people claiming that they could use the board to contact their relatives. So people that look at maps here or look at history They'll see that the American Civil War was actually before 1890, but in 1890 Elijah Bond actually patented the idea of using the wooden planchette on the letters on it. 
Prior to that, people would just use crew boards, um, glasses, like how we do now, and, and different ways of doing the screen board. Um, of course, that bottom one there is a sign of things to come, how people could mon you know, um, monetize this, this activity and charge people because everybody wants to talk to their lost loved ones or lost friends, um, and people would play on that and they would charge people a lot of money to ultimately give them fake readings at times. Um, I've got a short video here of some spirit board activity. Make it play. Did you have a scooter? Mobility scooter? Oh, I know him, did he used to park it outside? Did you have a mobility scooter? Yes, I'm very sure about that. Very sure about that. So how do you feel about this communicating with someone who Did you say you know, the past two weeks ago? Yeah. 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 How did you die to? <laughs> <laughs> you can spell it out. Has anyone told you still did? Are you still here? Yeah. You didn't burst into flame. So most of each boards are the same, they've got some numbers on, some letters on, a yes and no, hello, goodbye. A, B, C, 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 supposedly, and it moves the glass. So, if, for those that were listening to my first half, not many, um, it's the ideometer effect, maybe. So again, they're having this, this sensation that it's not them actually moving the glass, but subconsciously, it probably is. However, the spoon board is my favourite piece of equipment, because, or my favourite experiment, because anything that involves multiple people it really limits the possibility of the ideometer effect. Because if you've got, let's say, six people with their fingers on the glass, what's the chances of them all wanting to take the glass to H? Very slim. You might have someone wants to take it to J, someone wants to take it to E. And if that was the case, you'd have this kind of internal struggle, and the glass would just be vibrating and not really moving anywhere, because they're all fighting to move it somewhere else, consciously. But anyone that's ever done it and has experienced the glass move, it moves with such fluidity, with such ease. And you can tell that nobody's moving the glass. And what I tend to ask people to do is to put their little finger on the glass with their nail, so it's upside down, because it's more difficult to push the glass then, because your nail kind of slips and slides on the glass. You can't really get any grip on the glass. And it's, easy, it's easier then to, to see that it's not the people that are doing it, subconsciously or not. Um, we did a, an interesting thing, we've done it a few times now, but the one that sticks out in my mind was we did an investigation at Smedic swimming baths, fully functioning swimming baths. And one thing I'll say is if the location looks haunted, it's probably not. Um, if the location doesn't look haunted, it probably is. Um, and this place, we turned up <laughs> about 6 o'clock in the evening to start setting things up, and there were still little children swimming, and it felt quite surreal. To, you know, you we're coming in to do a ghost hunt. And, there were children in their armbands on, swimming around, going down slides. And they all filed out and we started our investigation. We were in a corridor, um, kind of on the back of the swim bus, I think it's where the staff room was and things like that. And there were, uh, the team all disappeared off and it left myself and another crew member. And we were just walking up and down the corridor asking questions and we heard a, um, a cough. Very feminine, I know that sounds weird, but it did sound like it was a female coffee cleaning her throat. So I've um, kind of run down to the bottom of the corridor where it came from to find that the corridor has one way in and one way out. So the bottom of the corridor was a dead end. It led to a boiler room and that was it. So whatever we'd heard had nowhere to go except back past us. So we couldn't really explain that. So as I came back out of the room and turned the corner to see my colleague, I was signalling to him, don't know what that was, and we, I had a very, very loud whistle in my left ear that sent me sprinting back towards the other crew member. Um, very loud whistle, right in my ear hole. And we thought, oh, this is quite an active place, we should try and do a board. At this point, a few other guys came along and we were doing a board, and 
had to lean on the windowsill because there's nowhere else to do in the corridor. And then a couple of people got bored and left, and it left us with me, the crew member, and another guest. Don't know the guest, he'd just come along with us on the night, didn't know who he was. And we were doing the board, and he said, I think this is my dad. And I thought, oh, okay, well, take your finger off the glass, and me and um, Les will carry on doing, doing the board, you just keep asking questions, because I didn't want him to affect the glass. So he took his finger off, carried on asking questions. What street did they grow up on? What's the name of my eldest son? What's mom's name? How did you die? He asked about eight or nine questions. And me and Les answered every single question right. He ended up crying in a bit of a state. We had to go and carve him down with a cup of tea. Uh, and it was okay. But I can't explain that. I can't explain it. Because if it's not a spirit that's moving the glass around the board, which is what apparently it is, then surely we're talking about some kind of telekinesis or some kind of psychical power where he's planting the answers in our head for us to move the glass. Both are equally interesting and fascinating, um, but most people will claim that it's the spirit that's moving the glass. Now, you never get the glass moved without touching it, though. Loads of times you put the glass down and we say, right, move it, and it never moves. It will only ever move when we're touching it, which makes me think, so is it possible that it's us doing it? Very, very possible. But there are things such as that experiment that I've just explained. There are things such as putting a word in an envelope next to the board, only one person knows, and seeing if it can answer what's written down inside the envelope. There are things such as on Friday where I'm going to blindfold everyone doing it to see if they can still spell out words without seeing where they're taking the last subconsciously. And these are all different ways that we can try and limit down and try and really figure out what it is that's going on here. Because what a lot of people do is they just say, well, it's a spirit. It's a spirit, it's a spirit, it's a spirit, because that's what sells. It sells TV programs, it sells tickets, it sells um, toys. So the spirit board, like I say, it is my favourite piece of uh, equipment, my favourite experiment, because when you're in the moment and you're feeling that glass move around, around the board, and you can tell that no one else is touching it, it's a really strange sensation, as I'm sure people that have done it can, can attest to. Um, has anyone got any questions on the spirit board? Yeah. <coughs> well, that sounds remarkably like Jung's collective unconscious. Um, yeah, very, very, very much so. Um, but again, if, if there's a collective unconscious, if there's something that's, that's been thought by six people that's, that are all in the same room, that, you know, in my mind, that's probably more interesting than than a yeah, spirit. You know, it's, 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 it's worth it's worth uh, researching. Yeah, many years ago when I was young and sprightly, uh, I mm -hmm. many, many. <laughs> uh, some friends used to collect in uh, one of our house, one of one of one of a house belonging to one of our group, and we often used to do uh, a a Ouija, Ouija, Ouija board. You know. This one particular night, I decided not to get involved, and I just sat on the sofa watching, and uh, I just sent a message to the spirit that, that was in contact with them. They, you know, they, they were just moving it around slowly, the glass was moving slowly. I just sent a, a message uh, for proof for myself. I said, um, in my head, make the glass whiz round in a circle madly. All of a sudden, they just did that, and everybody was going, whoa, 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 what's happening? It was just, right? well, we, we've had that loads, and what, what people need to remember when things like that happen is, again, in this kind of, this, this, this generation that, you know, we need to have an answer now. Um, sometimes the glass just wanders around the board aimlessly, sometimes it goes in circles, sometimes it doesn't really know what it's doing. If you were talking to a spirit from 17, 1800, most of these people were illiterate, they couldn't talk, most of them properly, they couldn't write, they certainly couldn't spell their own name. So if you're asking, what's your name, what's your name, I mean it's kind of going, probably hasn't got a clue. Or you could be talking to a child who never learned to spell, so doesn't know how to write the answers that you're asking. So these are always, you know, things that you should be thinking when, when you're maybe disappointed in what you're getting. Um, also, it's important to point out to never fully trust who you're talking to on the spirit board, as with most pieces of equipment you used to interact with on the spirit board, because it could easily lie to you and tell you, you know, who you want it to be. And I always point out to people that are doing this with me, if, if let's, for example, say, um, what's your name? And it's, uh, it goes um, K I E R, and someone will always in the group go, Oh, is it Kieran? And you know, the glass will go, Yes. So that. And I always say, Don't do that. Don't answer for them. Let them answer fully. 
because they might jump on the back of what you want to hear or what you want to see and they will play along with you. We have a spirit that follows us, calls himself Jack. We call him a lot worse. He's not a very nice man. He comes through on the board, he comes through on the spirit box, which I'll talk about later. Um, he swears a lot, has very nasty swear words. Uh, called one of our groups an obese woman. Um, and he's just not a very nice guy. And he led us along once, and we were doing a board, and we didn't click. And we asked the name, and it said Jackie, J-A-C-K-I-E. We asked how old she was, she said 11. We asked, you know, uh, did, we were in a school, did you go to school here? She said yes. So all things that we thought, well this makes sense, we're in a school, it's a little girl called Jackie, she said she went to school here, this is all good. Um, she then spelt out wanker. We thought, that's not what an 11 year old girl is, right? <laughs> That's not that. That's not. That's not right. So someone went pardon, and it spelt it again, and it spelt it fast. It's really fast. And then um, we said, "Who are you with?" And it shot over to, to one of our crew members. We said, "Oh, you're with her." And then it spelt out "obese woman." And this lady was very shocked, very offended. Um, and someone clicked, and someone said, "This isn't Jackie, is it?" And it went, "No." <laughs> And he went, who is it? And he went, he spelled Jack. So again, he didn't say, is this Jack? He said, who is it? He wanted the spirit to answer. He said, Jack. So it's a, an example of how a spirit can play with you. You might think you're talking to someone good. He probably isn't. I mean, I don't think this guy's, you know, negative. I just think he's a very rude bloke who likes to laugh with us. I don't know who he follows. I don't know who he sticks with, but he's always there. Um, we always used to get the spirit... Uh, Identifying itself as WG. Okay. Which I thought years later, years and years later, I thought, oh yeah, Ouija, WG maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, possibly, yeah. yeah. So WG all the time. Yeah, I mean, we, we, like I say, we get spirits that follow us. Um, he just sticks out in my mind because he's a bit of an idiot, to be honest. Do you, do you find it a bit weird now that they do admit to lying? So I've had that as well. It's the weird thing that they would admit often if you say, are you lying, and they'll say yes, but it's only if you confront them. If you confront them, yeah, and I've, I've had people say, oh, it's, it's the laws of the spirit world, I was like, oh, you've been there, have you? Even though they think it's funny, but, you know, yeah, I'm lying. Yeah, um, I think people like to say, people say it's the laws of the spirit world, and I, I think, well, you don't know that, because, you know, I mean, I, I, I've not died yet, so I don't know what it's like in the spirit world. Well, let's um, hope it's not like that, because it sounds very... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to me. well, yeah, um, I think... I think you're right, if you confront them, they, nine times out of ten, they, they will admit to what they're doing. Yeah. Um, but again, it's just something you need to be careful of when, you, when you're doing investigations. Um, questions you always, always need to ask. We did one, we put um, the word orange in an envelope. We asked the board to spell, or tell us what was in the envelope, and it spelled colour. So, you know, and then someone said, yeah, but we, we meant the fruit. <coughs> You know, give him some credit. Um, so, this isn't technically um, equipment or an experiment, but it's a phenomenon. It's orbs. So, everyone's familiar with orbs. What are people's thoughts on orbs? Does everyone know what orbs is, by the way, when I talk about orbs? Yeah? Mostly does. Mostly does. Okay. Um, agreed. Unless, unless one, except for the ones caught on video, you see them. Well, I think he does as well. What I tend to, my, my rule of thumb with orbs is when you are, when you're filming something, if you see, sometimes you can see dust and you can see it and it's all moving in one direction because there's a draft or whatever in the room. If you then see a piece of dust or an orb that begins to act independently on its own, it can pick up speed, it can slow down, it's going in the opposite direction, I tend to then think, maybe that is something. You have two cameras. And you record, if it's on both cameras, it's probably good. If you get it on one, yeah. it's a light reflection. Very, it's very possible. So I mean, yeah. just a bit of humour there. Yeah. You know, I mean, what if that was the case? What if they were trying to get captured? People say, oh, it's the manifestation of a ghost. It's the only manifestation of a ghost. Well, possible, but there's no scientific proof to say that spirits manifest as orbs. Now, Unfortunately for you lot, I'm now going to subject you to some of my dancing. <laughs> um, so this was in Draco Tunnels, and we had a special, uh, we treated ourselves at Christmas, and we went down just as the crew, 
And this is in the kitchen area, which is a very busy, busy area, um, spiritually. And it's where everybody would have gone to sit and have their dinner, have their meals, and the canteen, they used to have discos and music there. And we decided to play some Vera Lynn, some classic 1940s music, because that would have been the prime music that they would have listened to. So we were playing some Vera Lynn on the spirit board, and I said, um, I'm going to turn Vera Lynn off now, I've enough. And the glass shot to know. I was like, alright, I'll leave it on. <laughs> so we left it on. And we decided to have a dance, so we asked the spirits, come and have a dance with us, come and, come and have a dance. Now like I say, my dancing's not great. I, I try to stick to Northern Soul if I can. <laughs> Vera Lynn's not my thing. Um, but what you're going to see is um, a red orb will come around me and towards the camera and you might hear on there someone shout, what the hell is that? And it's just an interesting piece of footage, so I'll show you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's breath that you can see there. Can you see the from that one again? There so is a video where I'm dancing with a chair. Don't know why. I'm not sure if you can see on this. Yeah. Um, but so it comes around like a bum. What's that? What bum? Yeah, so what's interesting about that is, one, it's red, and you can see dust, we're in a tunnel, it's a dusty floor, I'll play it again in a minute, you can see dust being thrown up from the floor, as we said, and it's all going in one direction, it's all coming up as we're kicking it up as we're dancing, or moving. Um, what's interesting is if you look closely, and I can show this to anyone who wants to have a closer look on the laptop after, if you look closely, there are two orbs, and they're intertwined, as they come round me, they're kind of dancing around each other, as if they're dancing. And they come round me towards the camera and moved off. Um, and it's red, so I've had people say, yeah, but the camera was making it red, it was reflecting on, 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 onto, the, onto the dust. Um, possible, but it's red from quite or far away. So I, don't think, I think it would have got red as it got close to the camera, but this starts off red. Could it be an insect? Maybe, but I don't know of many red insects. So if we play it again, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think it was. Where was it coming from that way then? So you might be able to see what looked like, you know, little pieces of just sliding up. The quality's not that great. Yeah. About so the one there that went up, and then this What's one. What's that? What the? What is it? What? Me and someone. So it was seen. It was seen by the in person. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, so they saw, they physically saw it, you can hear them react to it, so they actually saw it. Um, so it's not a photographic effect? No, no, that they, they saw it, um, which is even more interesting. Um, so that's a, good, that's a good piece of footage that I like to show people. Um, okay, anyone got any questions on? How did they describe it? How did they describe it? Did it look the same? Yeah, so they, they first described it as a, a, a red ball of light. But of course, when you look at it more closely, you can see that there were two small orbs that are kind of dancing around each other. Red seems to be the colour, red and purple in grey colour. We've often seen red, red orbs kind of float across the, um, the, the walls and things like that. Uh, an interesting story about an orb was, I wasn't there, but I have to believe them, they're my family. My brother and my dad were sat watching matches of the day one day. And we're West Bromwich Albion family, so I doubt they were watching an Albion game. And this orb came through the curtains, sunk down to the floor and moved across into the kitchen. They saw it, it was a big ball of light, it looked 3D, so it wasn't like a, a torch light being shone on the wall. It was in the middle of the room and it moved up into the kitchen. Um, once it got into the kitchen, the dog sprinted out of the kitchen where he used to sleep, sat in the doorway and growled into the kitchen at whatever had just gone in there. So we talk about the animals that can see things that we can't. Uh, after about five minutes, it calmed down, it went back to sleep in the kitchen. They never saw it again, but it came, they said it came through the curtains, sank down to the floor, about six inches or so off the floor, and moved into the kitchen. The first thing I said, sorry? Sounds like ball lightning. Yeah, the very first thing I said to my dad was, it was ball lightning. But there was no distinct evidence of it being ball lightning, such as the smell of sulphur, which is often accompanied with ball lighting, or um, the size of it was quite sizable, they said it was bigger than the football. And ball lightning is often quite small. Um, so, an interesting phenomenon, um, but again, something that's 
most certainly worth telling you guys about. Also, to be honest, people say more lightning, it's totally unexplained phenomenon itself, and they just use that and say, well, that's explained. Give a name to something, it's not saying what it is. Yeah, I mean, I mean, say, yeah, I mean, I think they do not know what it is. No, they don't. They don't know what it is. They try it last month, not time. Okay. But I guess it's quite a broad thing as well, so they need to just say, oh, all right, dismiss it. Yeah, it's easy on. I mean, the thing that's paranormal is the definition of paranormal is anything out of the normal. So people all can't explain that, um, and therefore oh, it's paranormal. So they don't try to explain that. Um, and yeah, and, and unfortunately that's, that's the, you know, the world we live in. So, a spirit box, or a ghost box, or Frank's box, because it was invented by a guy called Frank. Anyone familiar with this? No? Yes? Basically, yeah, it's, it's a radio scan. So what, so when you're in your car and you're scanning radio stations, you push a button, scans to the next station, it stops, you listen to that station. This has that ability taken out, that's all it is, it's a radio scanner. As soon as it finds that frequency, it sits on it for like a millisecond, you can change how long it stays on it, and then it finds the next station, and you have this constant um, sweeping of stations, as it's called. And depending on how much you take your, your model, you can have a sweep at different rates, you can reverse the sweeping, you can change from FM to AM. And it just serves two different frequencies. The idea is that the spirit will um, use those frequencies to communicate with you. And it will hop onto these frequencies in order to work to talk to you. Um, I think it's, it's a fascinating piece of equipment, but I think it lends itself to um, pareidolia very much. So is anyone familiar with what pareidolia is? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's the, the ability to recognise patterns where there aren't any. So people see faces in clouds and stuff like that. Um, now, the one thing that makes this piece of equipment special to me is the experience that I had the morning after my nan had died. So, we were, as most families do, she died about half one um, in the morning. And we all gathered around my mum and dad's house the next day. And my granddad asked if me and my brother would go and empty, uh, not empty, sorry, rearrange these house. They got the bed downstairs, the coffee table upstairs, all that stuff. So we agreed and we went down to do it. As we were doing it, my brother turned around to me and he said, what do you think? Do you think she's here? And I said, I don't know, you know, she died like eight hours before. I said, oh, I don't know. He said, well, should we, should we ask? Now, as every good paranormal investigator does, I had some equipment in the car, and I went out and I grabbed the spirit box. Then I came in, turned it off, and we started to ask, you know, Nan, are you here? We got a yes. Now, if anyone's ever heard this or used this, um, it's short, stabby words that you get like, uh, 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 like that. That's what it sounds like, basically, with what a static in between. So to get what sounds like yes is possible. You're going to get a yes. So I thought, uh, okay, maybe not. So now you hear. We got a louder, more clear yes. I thought, okay, fine. I said, Granddad's not here. Granddad's at Mum and Dad's. We heard Raymond. My granddad's there. We both looked at each other. Did you just hear that? Yes, I heard that. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Yes, Raymond. I said, yeah, Raymond, granddad. He said, mum and dad's. We had Adrian. That's my dad's name. I thought, okay, the chances of getting Raymond and Adrian are very, very slim. Interesting. I said, yes, dad, Adrian. She said, Kieran. She never called me Kieran. It was Kieran. And that's how he said it on the spirit box. At this point, my brother kind of slaps me on the back and goes, what? You know, I was like, I oh, know, I know. Um, so this was getting very interesting very quickly. So we, my brother asked, are you in pain anymore? She said no. Um, and then eventually she, she started, we could hear a lot of noise, it was a lot of chatter. And I asked, you know, who are you talking to? Where are you? And we heard a reply and it said, they're my grandchildren, as if she was talking to somebody. So to have, they're my grandchildren is interesting because it's a long phrase, which you don't really get on this piece of equipment, it's short, stabby words. And we were her grandchildren. Very interesting. It then kind of died off, and um, she uh, said, "You know, what's going on now? Where are you? Tell us." And she came out with terrifying. We thought, terrifying. You know, this point, like, this is a noise. You know, what's terrifying? What's wrong? And the spirit box stopped. So I was whacking it on the coffee table. Sorry, Nan. Trying to get it to come back on. I was hitting it on the wall. It was on, it just wasn't doing anything. Never happened before. 
eventually kicked back in and we had about 10 seconds of static while my brother shouting, what's terrifying? And eventually she came out with, God. At this point I dropped the spirit box and went outside. My brother stayed. It told him to go upstairs to the bedroom, but it fizzled out. I don't believe in God, but I'm a complete and utter atheist. Um, so to get that God is terrifying by my nanny who recently died, um, to this day, right, standing right here right now, it scares the hell out of me. Because I believe the life after death is consciousness, and it's nothing more than energy that has remained without a biological vessel to experience. Still reverts back to quantum physics, which means there's a God. Um, I believe that we are God. Exactly. I believe that I am God. That you're God. Did you Nan believe in God or did you like? Uh, Nan was very religious. Well, maybe she was kind of, because she'd only just recently passed. Yep. And she became all sentient, all knowing, all things that we don't know. Yep. It was terrifying to her the fact that she realised there was no God. Maybe. Possibly. I mean, we, we've described it as, because she was talking to someone, they're my grandchildren. So we think she was almost in this limbo, this waiting room, with other people that, that had just passed. Yeah, she's still at, in the house. Yeah, in this, in, in this weird, like, in purgatory you'd call it, limbo. Yeah, and I think she was a bit scared, she didn't know what was going on, she was a bit confused. Um, that's what me and my brother have, have told ourselves. We never told mum or dad, or at the time granddad when he was alive, we never, never told him. So she was still connected to the earth thing quite strongly? Which is why she was coming through so strongly. Yeah, I think so. And, and we, we, I, when my granddad died, it was a council house. And we had to gut the house and rip it all out for the council. And my mum backhanded me the key to the house. And we went and did an investigation there before we had to get back over. And we got some interesting stuff from both uh, my nan and granddad. So she was still there then as well. My granddad died um, before I could tell him that my wife was pregnant. And we started the board. And, um, yeah, yeah. And we asked, "What? What's your? You know, who, who are we talking to?" And it's spelled Ray. And I said, "Oh, right, okay." I said, um, "You know, hi, granddad." And it's spelled Baby. All right. And I thought, "Oh, that's nice." He knows somehow. Um, but yeah, that, that was quite interesting. So, um, any questions on Spirit Box? So it's an interesting piece of equipment. No, I, I would just like to say, surprisingly. Believe me, it's taken me a long time to realise this, but most quantum physicists do believe in God. Not the Christian version, yeah, yeah. but a God. Yeah. A prime source, if you like. Yeah, so for me, that's universe. consciousness. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah. yeah. I don't believe there's a bloke with a white beard who sits no, on a cloud. Um, and for people that do, that's fine. I've got that's family members that do. That's probably what your grandmother discovered. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. She, she was that's an avid. She was an avid church girl. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think. I mean, basically, I think that we are. You know, we're all the same consciousness. We're all God, and this is just a biological vessel that we're experiencing this reality through. And when this biological vessel decomposes and it dies, as everything that's biological does, the consciousness is released and it, it returns elsewhere, or it hangs around in energy. So there are two different. What we call a spirit and a ghost are different definitions, and they often get mixed up. So a spirit is intelligent, it can interact with you, it can slam your kitchen drawers, um, it can look you in the eyes and acknowledge that you're there. A ghost is more of a recording, and that's almost like a residual energy. So if you imagine you live in a house for 45 years, and you're going up and down the stairs every day. You get up, you go and make your coffee, you go and get changed, you come down, you go to work. Every day. That's going to imprint some kind of energy on the building, on the framework of the building. People walk into a room, they don't, you know, they don't know what's happened there, but they say, oh, I don't like this room. And it turns out someone was murdered there or something. They're picking up on the energy. And that's a ghost. So there are, there are two different kind of definitions. And I think a ghost is a memory, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, it's a residual energy. And I think a spirit is the consciousness, the intelligent consciousness that is currently inhabiting all of these biological vessels sat in the room. Um, so an interesting story about um, an intelligent spirit and, and picking up on the residual energy is we did a place called Graysley, um, Graysley Hall in Wolverhampton. It's a very big, old, slightly derelict house. And we were in a room, it had three single beds, it was a bright red room, quite creepy. Three single beds and one vanity table with a stool. And I was sat on the stool and there were people sat on the beds all around. 
And there was this one guy who wouldn't sit down and kept pacing and pacing. And it wasn't a very big room. And I said, mate, have a seat, you know, take the load off. And he said, no, no, I can't sit down yet. I said, just sit on the bed. He went, no, I can't sit on the bed. I said, I'll tell you, you sit on the stool, I'll sit on the bed. So we swapped. Within five seconds of sitting on the bed, I was screaming, crying my eyes out, and I remember saying, if anyone has a gun, give it me, because I'll just end it all now. And I felt so hopeless and helpless, I felt horrible. At the same time, a lady sat near the door, it was one of old fashioned latch stores. She clicks the latch and opens the door. Someone says, what are you doing? She says, the door has to be open, I can't have the door locked in here. We did some research after and found that children were sexually abused in that room. And it would have happened on the bed that I sat on. And the lady would have picked up on the energy that she couldn't have the door locked. She has to have that door open. So it's that residual energy that people pick up on. People get it when they go to Auschwitz and places like that. Obviously people know what happened there. But if you don't know what happened and you pick up on an energy, it's really, really interesting. Um, and of course poltergeist activity. So poltergeist is German for noisy spirits, noisy ghosts. So people often think that poltergeist is evil. It's not. It just means noisy spirits. If something slams your drawer or throws your glasses around, it's a poltergeist. That's poltergeist activity. There isn't a spirit called a poltergeist. It's not an, an evil demon. So, pareidolia. So, the perception of apparently significant patterns or recognisable images, faces in random or accidental arrangements of shapes and lines. So, they say it's a human ability to make a face out of anything. So, again, it's interesting and it's something you need to remember when you're doing things such as a spirit box. We've had six or seven people sat around the spirit box and we've asked it to tell us how many spirits are here with us. And we get an answer. And then one person says, I heard six. Someone says, I heard nine. Someone says, I heard twelve. Now, none of those words sound like each other. You can't mix up nine and six and twelve. They all sound completely different. But it's what they're hearing in their own mind. So which one was right? Probably none of them. But it's just pareidolia. They're making a pattern out of something. The most common pareidolia, just for you guys, is that. <laughs> is it? Is it? The face on Mars. What is it, the face? Actually, it, what, what is interesting is that there is some evidence that after this photograph was, was observed by, uh, I've now forgotten his name, uh, and they started to investigate this particular face on the line, <coughs> that the face was passed through eight different kinds of filters <coughs> to, to make it now look as if there is no face on Mars, basically. And by Passing it, repassing it back through the same filters, according to Reuters, by passing it back through the same filters, you return to this space again. So I don't know, you tell me. Uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> um, I believe there was life on Mars. I believe there's, I believe there's life on Mars. I, believe, I actually think there's structures on the moon and stuff like that right now. Um, so I think it probably is a face. But it's just an example of pareidolia and how people can see faces in random patterns. Um, okay, so the next piece of equipment, moving on, is a thermal imaging camera. So this is a, a great piece of equipment because it allows us to see into um, ranges of the light spectrum that we can't see. So it allows us to see infrared, for example, so things that are warm, giving off infrared light that we wouldn't normally see. So as you can see by that camera there, his head's really warm, so it's coming up as red and then the call areas, they go down to blue, where it's cold. Now if you look at him without the camera, you wouldn't see those colours, you'd just see the human being. So it's that part of the light spectrum that we can't see. Some animals can, some animals can't. Now we did this, and we had it, um, and there were two chairs, and there was a guy sat in a chair, and we were filming him with this in the chair, you know, seeing, is there anything around you? And somebody noticed that the chair next to him was glowing red. We thought, well, that's interesting. So we you know, moved the camera closer and we could see a slight, ever so slight, indentation in the chair as if somebody was sat in it. So the guy in the chair next to it, he got up and we looked at it and both chairs were glowing red because he just sat in it, he transferred his heat energy to it, he was showing it was red. And that's exactly what the chair next to him was doing at the same time. And we left it, we went, we carried on our investigation, we came back, we put the camera back on the two chairs and they were both blue. There was nothing there, the heat had, had uh, escaped and it had returned to just being cool again. So is it possible that there was something sat next to him while he was sat there? Probably. Uh, but this allows you to prove that. 
and it allows you to see into different areas of the light spectrum that we wouldn't normally be able to see. We use ultraviolet light and ultraviolet torch, which is interesting. We often see shadows moving in the ultraviolet light that we can't see once the shadow moves out of the torch's range. So is it possible again that it's allowing us to see into that frequency that we can't normally see into? Um, just don't turn your ultraviolet torch around in your kitchen or your bathroom because it will make you think that you don't clean it well enough. Uh, my wife had a heart attack when I turned it on in the kitchen. Um, so again, just an example of the visible lights. So the ultraviolet, the infrared. Um, there are some people, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a guy called Barry Fitzgerald. He used to be on Ghost Hunters International. He's quite a good researcher. He works a lot with Steve Mira. Steve Mira, yeah. Very good guy. Um, and, and Barry believes that Infrared houses negative energy and ultraviolet houses positive energy. I've got no evidence to support that, but it's a worth theory. He believes that if ever you're encountering negative energy on a spirit board, shine your ultraviolet torch on it, and it will subside. Um, they, iron, 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 iron. Pardon? It's an iron as well. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's a good guy, Barry. I mean, Barry, is, 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 he got me onto this thinking of what we eat and what we drink, which come on to the curry and the red bull. So if you go and do an investigation and you down two Red Bulls to make yourself stay awake, that kind of food and drink is um, responsible for giving people migraines, it makes your heart race, it makes you feel paranoid, and these are all things that people associate with um, spiritual activity. So we have people sitting there going, oh, you know, I've got a headache, is that a ghost? No, you just downed two Red Bulls like an hour ago, and you've got a bag of sweeting around. So stuff like that. Also, eating a curry, first-hand experience, you're sat around at half one in the morning, you're slightly hungry, your belly's grumbling, and you say, can you make a noise? Just look, make a noise. And then you hear a noise, and everyone goes, what was that? And I was, that was really sorry. Um, we even had a, a lady, it was a lady, she fell asleep, woke herself up snoring, and shouted, did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, you saw it. She couldn't believe it, she genuinely thought, there's six or seven of us saying, no, that was you snoring, but she, she wouldn't have it, it was a ghost. Um, yeah, so um, Barry and Steve actually, I don't know if any of you went to Awakening this year. Yeah. yeah. Did you see Barry and Steve's presentation? Yeah, Fascinating stuff. Uh, they, they, for those that didn't see it, they talk about a cup and how um, the cup can, they basically, a cup was moving in a house. So they found it in one room, it ended up in another room. And they put it under a microscope, correct me if I'm wrong, they put it under a microscope to see the anatomic structure of this cup. They did it before and after it had moved. And after it had moved, the, the structure of the cup had completely changed. It wasn't the same cup. It was the same cup, but it wasn't the same cup. So what they were saying is this cup wasn't picked up and moved, even by a, a spiritual force. It had almost disappeared and been and be reconstructed in the other room. Very interesting. I spoke to Maurice Gross from the SPR. Yeah. Um, he was a sort of lead investigator in that at the Enfield case. Enfield, that was really yeah. old guy's case. And you got to meet him? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, amazing guy. And he said, um, with what you're talking about, that while they were in there, when all this poltergeist activity was going on, there was a slipper, like, you know, a shoe. A slipper came, there were two of them up in the bedroom yeah. where the girls were, and a slipper came flying across the room towards them. So they moved out of the way and hit the floor and then disappeared as they were looking at it. So they thought, that's strange. At the same time, which they only found out later on when they were talking about it, two guys were in the room below, and suddenly a slipper fell from the ceiling and landed on the floor. And, and so it had gone through the, through the ceiling? It had gone through the ceiling. And now, obviously, as they studied it, it was like a solid slipper. It was unbelievable. Wow. And that fits in with the same kind of theory. Yeah, right. And people talk about aliens when they look at people, yeah, that they, they can go through a ceiling. Yeah. So it's almost like they're, they're altering the frequency. To, to change the genetic makeup of something. Because this table only exists because the atoms are vibrating to a particular frequency. If you can change that frequency, you can change the shape. Everyone's seen the videos of sand on the table, they change the frequency, it forms a different symmetrical pattern. That's what we're doing, we're vibrating to a particular frequency. Um, very interesting stuff. I know there's another guy who talked about the UFOs, that the electromagnetic frequency, and he says when they're coming in, when they're going out, they switch between go down into the like, microwaves, 
a lot of conjunctivitis, they get yeah. radiation burns, yeah. Yeah, yeah. because they've got it at the moment. They're and but that's also why we can't see them as well, because yeah. they're operating outside of our frequency range. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, right, so <coughs> I need Neil, to... Neil's born in 1939-1940, said that a basketball could pass through a wall, yeah. you know, so... It, but in theory, it can. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's fascinating. Um, right, so just got a few more pieces of equipment that I'll whiz through. So laser grid pen. Anyone ever experienced the laser grid pen? Know what it is? No, it is what it says. It is a laser pen. So everyone used to have fun with a laser pen as a child. I used to shine it in my neighbour's eye. Um, you used to get a slap for that. Um, but what we do with this, this particular piece of equipment is you put a cap on the end of the laser pen, loads of holes in it, you can make it yourself and it splits the laser into a grid, you shine it on a large blank black surface or white surface and it gives you that effect. And the reason for doing it is it enables you to see shadow activity a lot more clearly. So you'll see lights black out as shadows move across. We have had it very well, caught some stuff on camera. You can get them in different colours, I do prefer the green. Um, however, <coughs> skeptical side, side of me. If you stare at a laser for long enough, it's going to have some kind of effect on your eyesight on your mind and it's going to make you start to see things that aren't really there. Also, if you shine it on a surface that has any indentations in it or any lumps, um, it, the laser can't settle. So it begins to, it looks like it's moving. It's not, it's just trying to find a solid surface to settle on. So again, it gives an illusion of paranormal activity. It's just more of a, a, an illusion than paranormal. Um, a very good piece of equipment. You pick these up relatively cheap. Um, and like I said, they're just good for being able to spot shadows. We normally set a camera up like this and film it and throughout the night and then we'll review it the day after. Um, okay, REM parts. Now we spoke about this briefly earlier. So this is a radiating electromagnetism part. Bit of a mouthful, so we'll just call it the REM part. So this is similar to the K2 meter we spoke of at the start. Only what this does, and this is why I prefer it, is it emits its own electromagnetic frequency. So it doesn't rely on um, altercations in the surrounding EMF because that can be affected by mobile phones, faulty uh, fuse boxes or electric wiring and things like that. This creates its own. And if something interferes with that, it makes a noise or it lights up, just like a K2 meter. So has anyone ever heard of the ferrum? The old instrument, you yeah. move your hand close, it makes a noise. Yeah. It, that's exactly what it is. So we normally has an aerial on, on the top, and if something goes near it, it'll kind of go ooh, ooh, like that. And if you can afford a few of them, they're interesting to line up in a room. And we had it once, we had three lined up. We teamed up with some other crew, so we all used our own. And we kept hearing footsteps. So we lined them up in the room, and we had some great activity where it kind of went and then stopped, and then the next one went off, and then the next one went off, as if something was walking past all three of them. Very interesting. But why I like this, particularly compared to the uh, K2 meter, is because there's less chance of it being affected or interacted with by, you know, um, faulty pieces of equipment or wiring and things like that. Um, really good piece of equipment. I really enjoy using it. We've had some great evidence with it. Um, Probably next to the spirit board is my favourite piece of equipment to be honest. You just need to be careful that you don't use it in tight spaces because you can be stood there and it's poking someone in the back and it goes off and you might think you're quite far away from them in the dark but you're actually quite close and if this person all they have to do is move and roll them a little bit and it makes it go off and you think it's a spirit but it's just Joe Bloggs readjusting his position in a very tight cellar. Any questions on that? EVP recorder, we've all heard of this. Next to the K2 meter, it's the next best thing in anyone's toolbox. Um, just records voices, like a dictaphone. EVP sounds like electronic voice phenomena. Um, this is what we were using when we heard hello and we heard the growl, what I spoke about earlier. Um, we've had so much evidence on these. We've had, we've had people, um, we've had what sounds like crying, we've had what, uh, women screaming. One of the best pieces of equipment we had, uh, experiment and evidence we had with this, was we were in a cellar and everyone's phone was on flight mode and it was about one o'clock in the morning. Somebody's phone rang. They got the phone out, it was a private number, they didn't answer it. 
we said you should have that on flight mode. He said it is. Okay. About a minute later, someone else phoned me. We thought, right, whoever's tried to get that person is now trying to get that person. Turns out they didn't know each other, so that wasn't the answer. His phone was on flight mode, he's in the cellar, he's got no signal, private number. He doesn't answer. About a minute later, it rings again, someone else's phone. And everyone's screaming, answer the phone. So he answers the phone and he jumps straight onto loudspeaker, which we've never had before. I don't, I don't know of any phones that have done that. Jumps straight onto loudspeaker, we were in Wolverhampton, and in the broadest black country accent, it sounded like a child shouting, I really want to go home now. Sometimes it's a boy, sometimes it's a girl, I think it's a boy. And we have that on EVP. Um, and everybody looked at each other and said, did you hear that? And the phone hung up on itself and she just kind of looked at the phone like, what the hell? Um, and that's what we had. Did a bit of research, there were children buried under the cellar because um, it's in an area called Chapel Ash, you can look, in, look at this. And during uh, the plague and things like that, there was a bad outbreak and there was a tunnel that went from underneath this cellar to the church. And it's where people would transport the, the, the dead bodies of the people that died. And um, we had a, ch a child as loud as day shouting, I really want to go home now. It was quite sad. Um, now, the interesting thing to remember, Paradolia, is I did this with my wife Sally. We were watching My Girl Story and they put subtitles at the bottom to tell you what the EVP is saying. I mean, talk about putting it in your mind. So I watched it and she was making a cup of tea. I've got home well trained. Yeah. And they showed this EVP recording. And I watched it and I listened to it and I shouted her in and I put my hand in front of the TV to cover the subtitles and I said, what's this say? And I hit play. And she said something stupid, I can't remember what she said. And I said, okay, right, now I listen to it again. And I took my hand away so she could see what the subtitles were. And she went, oh yeah, completely different to what she thought it said. But when she read the subtitles, she said, oh yeah, that makes sense, yeah, that's what it says. So again, it's this subconscious is planting it in your mind. So when you're watching these programmes, just do it yourself, try it yourself. Everyone can pause and rewind the TV now. Just have a go yourself and see if you can hear what they're telling you to hear. Because it's paradoxical. It's the same as when everyone sits behind the spirit box. When someone hears six, someone hears twelve, someone hears seven. It's all what you want to hear at the time. Um, that's pretty much it, I think, smack on time. I do host a podcast with Ben, who's another investigator. Called the Paranormal Paradigm Podcast. You can find us on Facebook. Um, you can find us on Podbean, Anchor, Spotify, stuff like that. We interview. We've done a show on Rendlesham. We've done a show on Bigfoot. So it's not just about ghosts. It's kind of in the paranormal. So please have a listen to that and let me know your feedback. And I have got some books down here um, to sell: an introduction to paranormal investigation, and a fiver. If you want me to sign it, I will. Just down here if you want to come and buy one. Um, and has anyone got any questions? Have you got information well, on Rendlesham? Oh, hang on. Uh, we did a podcast on Rendlesham, yes. Did you, uh, you know, I was wondering about if anyone knows how to get hold of the actual binary message that Jim Penniston wrote. Um, well, I'm, I'm kind of well connect, connected with a guy called David Young. I don't know if you know him. Um, and he is very, very good friends with Colonel Holt. Um, and he knows all these people. So I, 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 uh, I'll talk to you after and I'll see if I can yeah. link you to that. <coughs> Sorry? Have, you ever seen Have I ever seen a ghost? I've had one, what I would describe as a full body apparition. So oh, this how was. How old were you there? Um, when well, I was investigating, so it was about two years ago or so. Oh, not. Yeah, so this was at Smedic Swimming Baths again. And it was um, one of our ladies was walking up and down the stairs because we, we kept feeling like we you know, just felt like there was something there. And she kept walking up and down, she said, I just feel like there's something behind me, uh, something following me. And um, she went up, she turned the corner, she came back around down the stairs, and there was a bloke behind her, about three steps behind her. All four of us looked at each other like, do you see that? And we could, it was a, a guy, he was wearing a hat, couldn't really see his clothes because she was stood in front of him, but he wasn't see-through, he wasn't um, opaque, he just looked like you. And eventually, I mean, she looked at us and went, Behind me, isn't it? <laughs> and we were like, yeah. yeah. And it was like someone was turning off a light to put in a filter on. Mm -hmm. and it kind of disappeared into himself and just vanished. 
Did he? Maybe he was still there, but after he cut his chin down, I don't Is know. Is that the only one you uh, That's the only, I mean, I've seen shadows, I've had knocks, yeah. I've had the experiences with my nan and things like that. Um, but I keep going because it's kind of like an addiction, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time you get nothing and you go home just tired and hungry. Um, but, you know, that one footstep that you hear, you think, oh, I want to go and I want to hear it again. I want to hear two, I want to hear three. And that, that's what keeps you going back. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. We, we all play Sky Watchers. Oh, yeah, yeah. We were looking at the sky. Yeah. We were up one night what, uh, on a Sky Watch, and on the way back after we finished, one of our lots saw a ghost. Wow. Woman in white. Would you like to tell us about that? Is it, it, was on, it was on Garth Mountain near Pentur. Well, what's interesting about that is um, people say that. that that UFOs, spirits and Bigfoot are yeah. always seen in the same area. Yeah. And I, 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 a theory I'm working on at the moment is how it's possible that what everybody is seeing is actually the same paranormal phenomenon. If you stripped away the matrix and the veil and, and got right down to the coding of the universe, as, as yeah. I suppose you could say, it's the same phenomenon. But people will put their own manifestation, their own image of what they're seeing. So isn't it interesting how anyone religious will always see the Virgin Mary? You know, if you if you want to if you want to hunt Bigfoot, you will always see a Bigfoot. And is it possible that what you're seeing is the same paranormal phenomena? It's just that because you're religious, you're um, you're, you're making it the Virgin Mary, or because you want Bigfoot, you're making it Bigfoot. But it's ultimately the same thing. Do you know the way John Peel? He he had John Peel's books. Uh, no, I'll yeah, look into it. they're really good, really recommended. Okay. He came to the same conclusion after decades of research that it was all. One lot of stuff. Cool. Um, what's your opinion on the skull experiment? Um, uh, yeah, this is just really, you know, that he had, uh, that they had, um, like, 1942, was it papers, materials, in the table, flowers? I, I, I might be getting these confused, but are, they, are these the same people that would have blank um, film? images and, and they would take them out of the box and they would have pictures on despite them being used. Fascinating. Because these are the kind of experiments that we need to do more of, but we don't because what we've done as a, as a, a I guess as a, a trade is we've got lost into the entertainment industry side of it. We've got lost into these television programmes, these running round haunted rooms with K2 meters that don't actually do anything, screaming at anything that makes a noise. The investigation has actually gone completely out of the window, and it's all about making money, unfortunately. You know, um, in the SPR, when it was first funded, um, uh, first, um, it came about yeah, in yeah. the 1800s, isn't it? Yeah. And they were the, um, the first people of the SPR contacting the, the, the people um, in the modern day SPR. Okay. Well, that's interesting because I watched a program on BBC, um, The Living and the Dead, I think it was called, and it tackles this. And it, I, I think, again, it made me start thinking that if time isn't linear, which I don't think it is, is it possible that when we are talking to someone on a spirit board, we're actually talking to someone from the future? But well, if you see a man walk through your house and you go, what the hell is that? He could be walking through going, who the hell's that? Mm. And what you're getting is two timelines mixing up. Um, and, and, and so that's very, very possible. Uh, okay, anyone else before we move on? Yeah, Laura Cannon was doing work with um, people doing impression who were speaking, supposedly speaking to Nostradamus in the 1500s. Oh. And um, so they would be talking to him. She actually wanted to have the true meaning of the hot trains. You know? right. But he would actually, at the same time as they were regressed speaking to him in the 1500s, he would be in his room and he'd see orbs appear in his room. And he knew he was speaking to spirits from the 1980s. Yes, yeah. yeah. but I mean, it's, it's happening like, simultaneously. It's like the others, you know, the film. You know the film, the others. If you've ever seen that with the yeah. Tolkien, yeah. and they think that they're being haunted, but in fact, it's they're the ghosts. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite, quite a good film. And it's similar to uh, the Living and the Dead on BBC. If you're into that kind of thing, it's on iPlayer. Give it a watch. Uh, anyone else? Cool. Okay. I've, I've got one more. Can we talk more? I'm really glad. Yeah, you know where I was in. Um, well, uh, the closest, on Friday, we, we, I've got in with the local landlord and my local landlord, and uh, we've done a few investigations there, and we're going there on Friday, so it's the closest we can get to Halloween, um, and yeah, so it should be good, maybe.
It's not, there'll be some good costumes. That's the, it's literally about 200 yards from my house, it's great. <laughs> uh, that's in, it's a place called Black Eve in Dudley, yeah. Do they still hold dances in Smeddy Park? Uh, it, well, it, that was the thing. We found out that you used to, I mean, I think the Beatles were playing there, which is crazy. I, I, I so, the yeah, so when we heard the, uh, when we heard the whistle and the lady clearing her throat, we asked what was this area? And it was where the dressing rooms used to be for the artists. So it was possible that this lady was, you know, warming up, warming up her vocals. Well, that's cool. It's an interesting place. If ever you can go back to do a spirit. Yeah, it's, um, Okay, yeah, it's moving to move off, yeah, it's cool. Not, not a question, but we might have this is a Halloween relevant. The only full body manifestation I've seen was like last Halloween. And I, we were in Spain, I was out in front of my wife's friend's garden, and there was this guy who was looking through the gate of the house, looking at kids doing yeah, Halloween, and they were doing, going out collecting the sweets. There was a man watching them, and I looked and I thought, oh, that's odd, because I didn't recognise him from the family that we were visiting. I looked away, I looked back, he was gone. I asked them, is there another door? And they like, no, there's no way out. It was a closed courtyard. He was watching the Halloween procession. Okay. He just disappeared straight after. It's really weird. That's so weird. weird. So they didn't respect Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, right, I guess that's it. Thank you very much for coming.